Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Jorge Baron, Executive Director of Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, Wayne McMullen, Senior Vice President of Programs and Legal Strategy at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, and Carol Rose, Executive Director of the ACLU in Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our Zoom attendees, we will take three snap polls during the show and announce results. And questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. It's so great to have you all here to talk about rights at this time, particularly with what is happening during the pandemic where people are yelling at each other about liberties and, and, and their rights, uh, where we're trying to cajole each other into protecting each other. We have the Black Lives Matter movement and our history here in America is, is so fraught. I, I learned a certain history, um, but that history did not concentrate on the uh, European colonization of America from a native perspective, um, in which uh, people were killed and disenfranchised and disempowered. We had uh, our independence, war of independence uh, that preserved slavery. And then we fought another war and, and in the aftermath preserved the uh, the uh, repercussions of slavery through Jim Crow laws. We struggle over gender, sexual orientation, religious freedom, xenophobia, free speech, clean air and water, right to bear arms, the list goes on. It is so wonderful to have you all here to talk about your, your approaches. And if you could unmute yourself, then, uh, then we, can, we can start off with uh, Jorge. If you could just talk a little bit about uh, your work at the uh, uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, um, how you advance uh, civil rights and liberties in the United States through, through your efforts. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of the, the panel today with, uh, um, with this group of uh, human rights advocates. Um, so we at uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, uh, we operate here in Washington State, where we're based, uh, focus on providing direct immigration legal services for low-income people who are trying to navigate our, our very uh, unjust and, and complicated immigration system in the current time. Uh, so most of our work is focused on working with individuals who are trying to navigate uh, this very complex system, but we also engage in, in what we call uh, systemic advocacy, which is trying to uh, pursue changes to immigration policies, uh, both the local uh, and regional level uh, through uh, litigation efforts, uh, through public policy advocacy, uh, and through community education. So uh, needless to say, uh, the last few years, I, I think it's been a, a very difficult uh, um, uh, area of work, but um, uh, needless to say, with the current federal administration that has taken a particularly uh, harsh and, and very problematic line with regard to immigrants and refugees, uh, it's been particularly challenging. And I would say that you know it was difficult uh, six months ago uh, but uh, the pandemic has only exacerbated uh, many of the inequities and disparities, uh, and I look forward to, to talking uh, today about how that's, uh, how that's playing out on the ground level. Well, we call ourselves a nation of immigrants, don't we, Wayne? <laughs> you know, we do call us, uh, ourselves a nation of immigrants, and it's actually a, a phrase that um, wasn't really popularized until um, the uh, the reforms to the, the, the old racist um, quota system of the immigration system that was being reformed in the 60s at the height of that civil rights moment. Um, uh, and I think that's a good segue into, you know, what, what we try to do at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights is we're an organization founded in 1968 after we lost Bobby Kennedy. Um, and it was founded by his friends and family to be a living memorial to create uh, 501c3 NGO instead of just a marble monument to carry on his unfinished work of social justice and um, engaging in those battles um, at that intersection of racial and economic justice and leveraging our privilege and our power and our platform um, to work in solidarity with leaders of social movements and frontline advocates is precisely the work that, that we're engaged in right now um, and kind of our lane within this great ecosystem of a movement for civil liberties and human rights. Um, primarily what that looks like for us in, in, in this moment and of late is working in the criminal legal system with local organizers, formerly incarcerated people, to engage in that systemic structural reform, particularly around issues of money bail and ending wealth-based detention. 
um, for those um, caged pre-trial in our system, as well as with local activists and organizers uh, working to end co local collaboration with ICE's cruel deportation machine. And so looking at local sheriffs and their ability um, to end that cooperation and not to reinforce those kind of racist agendas that are coming down from on high and separating families in the interior every day. Um, uh, and then internationally, we work with human rights defenders to protect civic space. So basic fundamental rights to free speech, um, to carry out their work, to organize um, for a free press, the kind of building blocks of activism that um, the protective rights that, that, uh, that when exercised is the way that you exercise your defense of, of human rights. Um, uh, and, and this moment is more critical than ever to um, support those who are working on the front lines to build power in their own communities um, uh, as what we're seeing now is that you know the whims of government can change when you have someone like we currently have occupying in the White House um, but when when communities have and retain and hold power um, then we can see that systemic change sustained uh, and communities flourish. What I find to be so very interesting, and you, you see this in the history of the ACLU, um, which uh, uh, was founded before the Scopes trial, which really brought the ACLU with Karen, Clarence Darrow's uh, defense um, uh, to, to uh, national and indeed international prominence, is this idea of America, which was founded in rights, founded in immigration, uh, founded in advocacy, founded in community movement building, really. Um, and, and now, uh, so often, uh, those, um, those acts are seen as um, being, um, uh, they were pejoratively referred to, yeah, as if, as if uh, it's a negative. Um, Carol, can you talk a bit about ACLU's work in Massachusetts and, and nationally and indeed beyond our borders? Thank you. And it's so great to be here. I'm so honored to be on this panel with Jorge and Wade and with you, Mark. Um, and it's great to, to see everybody. You know, the ACLU has been around for 100 years. So we're an old organization, so to speak, but always renewing ourselves. And I think that's important for any nonprofit, no matter how long we've been around, is that we're always renewing and responding to what's happening at the time and on the ground. Um, so we have an office in all 50 states, um, as well as a national office. And so we're a confederated organization, kind of a network, if you would, uh, each independent and yet working together. Um, we're also a multi-issue organization. So uh, we work on a range of rights set forth in the Bill of Rights in the Constitution from immigrants' rights, racial justice is a huge one right now, uh, privacy rights, technology for liberty, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and really talking about the next, the intersection between all of these um, and, the, and the rights of all people uh, being related to one another. Um, and, and the other thing that we do is work, so we're a law reform and policy reform organization, so we do the kind of structural uh, reforms that, uh, that uh, Jorge was talking about, but we don't do it alone. Um, we always work as part of a movement. We work with partners on the ground who are doing direct service work because those th that's really where the rubber hits the road. But for a lot of our partners, they don't have the time to come up and sort of look at the overall structural reform. So we look, we work together in close relationship and close trust building and movement building relationships to try to find ways to make, to do those power shifts that Wade was talking about uh, to make sure that people on the ground have a say uh, and have power in making the change come true. So it's not just, you know, the old ACLU was very much just litigators, right? Now we integrate the advocacy. So there, we still have litigators, you know, we can sue people, but we also work uh, in, in the legislatures at the state level and in Congress. We also work uh, in the press online through social media, as well as traditional press. And we also work uh, in, in partnership and in coalition um, and with a real field program. So mobilizing uh, the ACLU membership to take action um, in support of law reform and systemic reform, but also working in coalition with our local partners on the ground to help them uh, decide what they want to achieve and then helping them to do it. So it, it's a really integrated model um, that's been a long time in the making, but I think is right for the time. One of the things that, that I find so fascinating and one of the reasons why we, we invited you all here is that you work at the intersection of, of uh, tactical activity, on the ground, uh, real activity with, with individuals, litigation, uh, advocacy, and so on. Uh, strategy, systems change. You're working on systems change. And also media, movement building, the whole idea of engaging American citizens in, in the process. How do you uh, 
uh, balance those because you each have to choose your issues and they have to be chosen in reference to all three. You can't afford to just take the tactical view and not deal with the system side. You can't afford to deal with the system side but not have anybody engage. In other words, not deal with the media side. How do you, how do you balance your work, choose your issues, uh, focus so that your investment of time, energy, and treasure has the impact that you wish it to have. Wade, why don't we start with you and then uh, Carol and then uh, Jorge. Sure, um, thanks so much. Uh, I think that what we do at RFK Human Rights is, is we start with a power analysis and uh, we recognize you know, where can we add the most value, value to the movement, to these issues via our small team, but our team that sits with tremendous privilege and access to power and resources. Uh, and so when we, when we make that power analysis, you know, similar to what Carol was saying, you know, those closest to the problems are often, are always closest to the solutions, but they're often the most furthest removed from power and resources. Uh, and so we see our role as, um, with that power analysis, taking, you know, to sharing or redistributing our power, our access to power, our resources, um, and our platform. Um, precisely, and, and to work with organizations who to engage in that systemic structural reform, but perhaps it's kind of one step along the way. So oftentimes the way this plays out in our work is that we work with community bail funds, right? So these are, these are funds that are pooling resources to free their loved ones and community members from unjust incarceration in cages. They're paying their bail um, because the person that's incarcerated is only incarcerated because they don't have enough money in their bank account to afford that monetary payment. Now, just doing that seems like a Band-Aid approach, but we do it with groups who are posting bail as an intentional strategy to raise awareness, as an intentional strategy to gather data to use in the structural reform and policy reform fights. And they're paying bail and freeing loved ones using mass media, social media, the traditional press, um, to get more people on board to expose the injustice of this issue that's happening in everybody's backyard and to continue to organize, to build power. Um, and so we think that there's a couple of elements that are necessary for us to get involved. Obviously for us, we have a, a mission um, to work on issues in, that are in alignment with Robert F. Kennedy's life and work. So that intersection of racial and economic justice. We also um, believe that we're gonna be most effective by investing in local frontline advocates who are directly impacted by the systems we're trying to change uh, to help them build power, to take on their demands, their, their politics as our own, and to reinforce that um, through that redistribution of power access, um, through that redistribution of resources and, and platform as well. Uh, and so that can take on many forms. And a lot of the times, you know, we come in with access to the media or to uh, an influencer with a platform that can raise up the local work that these bail funds are working on or that these local organizers are working on um, to give more platform uh, and, and mass awareness to not only those groups and that the leadership that they are um, taking place in their own communities, but their, their vision for what should be and their vision for what um, the policy reform um, kind of uh, terms of debate and negotiation should be. So, so Wade, you're, you're basically looking at having, making one investment and having multiple ripple effects. You're investing in a particular issue. Bail reform, for example, is, is one of those. But then in doing that, you're popularizing it. You're collaborating with people you're working with in order to, to ensure that the message gets out. Carol, um, the ACLU has, has trod this path for, for a century, hasn't it? Well, I mean, I think it's <laughs> yes and no. I mean, I think in the old days, maybe it was a little bit less of a power analysis that started with, which now we do, uh, very similar to what Wade was describing. Uh, and so it's a deep listening exercise um, and, a, and frankly, an exercise in humility um, uh, to be able to go forth and then make sure that the right people are around the table. So for example, we recently did a campaign on what a difference a DA makes, a voter education campaign. And we had that being uh, largely both led and then populated by people who were uh, formerly incarcerated and then currently incarcerated with people. We actually had a debate among the DA candidates actually in a house of corrections and we had the people who were in the house of corrections asking the questions and it was amazing. I mean their questions were so much better than like 
you know, the questions that you would typically get in that kind of a forum. Um, and so um, it, it's a it's a sharing of power. It's a landscape analysis is the other piece. You know, what are the threats? So just as an example, uh, before uh, Trump became uh, president, uh, I would say that probably 80% of our resources were being worked doing on traditional racial justice work because here in Massachusetts, the federal level immigration was a big problem under Obama, but in Massachusetts, we didn't have a lot of local collaboration. Well now, since Trump, because so many families are being ripped apart and, and ICE has become such a problem, immigration has really come to the fore. So as we look at our various issues on our strategic plan, I was thinking of it a little bit like a stove, like you have things on the back burner and things on the front burner. And unfortunately, over the last three years, everything's been on the boil. Uh, and so this, this how, how do you begin to, um, you know, prioritize. And one of the things that we look for is intersectionality. So if there's a campaign or something that we can take on that's going to impact people from a range of different uh, constituencies that we work with, that might be a campaign that we're more interested in, in investing in because it'll have a broader impact. So that kind of a landscape and impact analysis, along with the power analysis, I think is really the starting point. Jorge, you know, there had been uh, criticism of organizations like, like all of yours in which uh, uh, people uh, have said, look, this is basically a bunch of white liberals with a bone to pick uh, using their clients to advance their agenda. Um, how is, is today this, this issue uh, viewed? And, and, and how do your clients respond to uh, this network of, of people, including your own organization, willing to help but also there is, there is awareness in this media saturated landscape that, that people are, um, are also uh, uh, being uh, leveraged, their stories are being leveraged to create attention surrounding issues. Yeah, no, Mark, I appreciate the question. And, um, you know, one thing that we always say here is that uh, if people are not criticizing us, we're probably not doing our job. So we often take uh, that kind of criticism uh, as a sign that we're doing the right thing. But I think it's there are some very legitimate concerns uh, that I think you flag. And I think it's true that we, we, we as part of the nonprofit sector need to be asking ourselves in terms of, you know, who are we speaking on behalf of? And I think uh, both Wade and Carol have touched on this about the sort of the power dynamics. Um, the way that we like to think about it here, because I think, um, uh, you know, in our role, we're primarily more of a direct services organization. Really, that's that's our focus. Um, about 85% of our staff is focused on, on providing direct assistance. So the way that we view that is, you know, we're looking for like what what do our clients come to us with needing help, right? Like they're telling us what they need. Um, and, and for them, it's, it's very basic. Um, it's, it's, you know, trying to stay together with their family, you know, avoiding deportation. Uh, it's being protected from violence. Uh, we do a lot of work with, uh, with uh, asylum seekers. Uh, it's being protected from from violence even in here and there uh, in the United States because they're being uh, they're uh, survivors of domestic violence uh, who are fearing an abuser who's threatening to to deport them and so um, for them it's a very concrete need um, and we're just trying to use the tools of the legal system and the immigration legal system and and you know frankly so many obstacles uh, that were present even before the current administration but more so now. Um, uh, to try to achieve those goals that the, that the clients bring to us. So that's kind of how we focus our energy in trying to figure out ways that we can do the direct service. But I think it is a valid concern. And, and we always, you know, when, I, when we meet with clients individually, I always tell them, you know, you're my boss, uh, which is true. As a lawyer, they're the ones who decide what the objectives are. And of course, there are rules, we can, certain things we can't do. Uh, but we're just going to be guided by the goals that they set for ourselves, even if we might disagree with, um, with a particular uh, course of action, uh, you know, we might want a client to fight their case because, you know, it's going to lead to a good precedent or something like that, but they may decide, you know, I, I can't stay detained for the time that it's going to take and, and we have to abide by, by the decisions that our clients make and, and, and give them, get, you know, retain the power when uh, so frequently the system is trying to take that power away from them. I think it's a very important point. I think it's also important to note that in today's media landscape with these tools, the fact that we can actually communicate directly through these little devices, um, there is an empowerment, uh, there's a power shift that is underway. I wanted to uh, just mention, and although we've been criticized um, uh, online uh, with validity, that, that the polls uh, that, that we're taking are kind of unfair and they're very difficult to answer. 
Um, the, the answers that we got to the first poll, which is who suffers the most, which is an unfair question, um, was, was interesting. 76% of respondents uh, felt that immigrants and refugees uh, really do suffer uh, tremendously. Um, people of color um, uh, also, 67%. Uh, um, uh, poor people, um, uh, almost half. People with disabilities, um, over a third. Uh, and women, uh, uh, about a quarter of people uh, feel that, that, uh, that uh, that's where uh, uh, those are the people who suffer the most from uh, an erosion of civil liberties. Interestingly enough, uh, no one voted for white people. Um, so uh, that, that's just kind of an interesting uh, response. And then and we also asked about uh, uh, civil liberties. Um, and we said since 1970, so roughly 50 years, we asked uh, whether we Americans have advanced civil liberties and justice for all more or less than our, our parents. And, and the consensus seems to be 65% uh, feel that we've advanced more than our, our parents, but a third of us, or almost a third of us, feel that it's about the same. Uh, and then the next poll, which is, uh, which is about to be, uh, be asked, and it would be great if everybody would respond, is what about the next generations? How do, how do our kids, how, do, how are they going to respond in, in our estimation? Do, you, do we think that, that they will be um, more or less or about the same uh, interested in, in, in these issues uh, going forward? But getting back to, to this conversation, in terms of, of how you uh, interact with others in your ecosystem, Carol, you, you talked about the fact that you work as a network. And people can not only uh, consistently work for an organization as staff and, and as board members and so on, but they can also dip in and dip out. They can actually find an issue that you're covering that, that captures their interest and really um, become involved. So you're basically partnering all the time and you're exploring new ways in which you can form alliances surround, surrounding different issues. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, interestingly, the ACLU membership actually quintupled after Donald Trump took power in the White House, primarily around the ACLU's work fighting the Muslim travel ban and then the family separation issue in the immigrant rights arena, uh, and now with the George Floyd murder and uh, the mobilization there. So we see these moments where people get more engaged. So we don't have a particularly large staff. We actually work with cooperating uh, attorneys to bring litigation suits. We work with uh, volunteers to do social justice mobilization on the streets and with coalitions to do social justice mobilization online and on the streets. Um, you know, we, we right now we're doing a huge amount of outreach with the public health community and with doctors and public health workers um, and with essential frontline workers um, on a range of issues, whether it's pay equity issues or access to health care issues. Um, and so we're constantly building new alliances. And I think of it very much as movement building um, because no organization, you know, we have to get away from the bad old days when, when organizations used to social justice organizations used to compete against each other, right? We're always going to be smaller than the government or from the, the forces of evil. But instead, we're really um, building coalition, building, and then and, and what we find is the pie increases. Uh, and we're able to do more work. Um, and, and I wanted to say something about to the point that the good points that you and Jorge were talking about in terms of potential, the dangers of exploitation of our client base. So obviously both ethically and, and morally our clients come first. So if we have to give up a social justice structural change because a client doesn't want to pursue it, we do that. Um, I think there's a real danger in going down the path of paying people for their stories um, because that it raises all sorts of ethical issues. Um, but what we've been doing is giving training to people who are sharing their stories, whether it's training in social, how to do social, to go on the television or go on the radio, or training in other aspects. We're giving um, um, opportunities for people to do other things, and, and that we can pay them for, um, you know, to do canvassing with us or, or something. But what we don't, I think we need to be mindful of never being in a situation of being accused of buying someone's story, because I think that raises a lot of ethical uh, concern. So I just wanted to mention that because it's been a conversation amongst the ACLU nationwide. Well, and Jorge, you're dealing also with a whole range of different issues that attach to the work of Wade and, and uh, Carol's organizations and, and so many others. You're dealing with, with uh, bail issues. You're dealing with imprisonment and incarceration. You're dealing with ch children, sep uh, you know, child separations. You're dealing with, with all sorts of different um, uh, organizations and partners, how does it work for you and your organization in terms of partnering? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think it's, and it's important to highlight. And when you're talking about the poll, I was just thinking like, you know, all of those categories also are clients of ours, right? Like, I mean, I think the issues of immigrants is uh, part of the LGBTQ community. When you talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you think about how Black immigrants are treated differently uh, than other immigrants in, in the system. So, so for us, um, you know, similar to what Carol said, you know, the ACLU is one of our close partners. We work here with the affiliate with Carol's colleagues here in Washington State and the, and the Immigrant Rights Project at the national level. Um, so there is this amazing ecosystem, uh, as, as folks have referred it to, and, and, and I think that's the one thing that gives me hope in some of these dark days is, is actually talking to colleagues who are doing great work and, and achieving significant victories. Um, in despite you know uh, uh, all of the all of the challenges right now, and and it does take you know collaboration. I think Carol is is absolutely right that I think there's a clear understanding that we can't we can't do it all, um, and that uh, we do better if we're working collaboration. We have a great uh, we actually had a coalition that was built here in Washington State called the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network uh, that brought together a number of organizations. So we have you know both you know very small grassroots groups. Um, you know, groups led by undocumented people, uh, and actually the leadership of the of the network, and we're very conscious about that, is led by directly impacted community members, undocumented folks, uh, who are the ones who are coordinating these efforts and who are you know running the the, the roundtable and the meetings, um, and that you know again helps us ensure that we're centering the voices that are that are most impacted by these policies, and I think that's been you know a really um, tangible way here in Washington State that we've been able to to formalize and help support. And actually, you know, and Carol mentioned that we've actually been able to grow the uh, funding for initially was a very sort of like volunteer led, you know, grassrootsy kind of uh, coalition. And because a lot of the organizations came together and we had relationships with foundations and with others, uh, people vouched for them and that enabled them to get resources that has now uh, made the organization uh, more, um, that coalition more um, uh, sustainable in the long term. So I think there's collaboration is, is absolutely critical to, to the work that, that we're engaged in. And Wade, Michael Taylor just asked a very interesting question uh, related to the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the real issues is, is are we crossing boundaries of, of, of conventional partnerships? The question was whether corporate America is actually uh, getting involved in any of these issues? Or are we finding that, that there's still kind of a schism uh, between uh, business interests and rights interests and liberties and so on and so forth? What is your experience uh, there, Wade? You know, it's a, it's a great question. It's an important conversation to, to be had. And, um, you know, far, far be it for, for me to speak for the Black Lives Matter movement and so far as their experience in partnering or collaborating with corporate America, but just, you know, more generally on just issues of racial injust justice and racial injustice. You know, the, the great Indian writer Arundhati Roy talked about the pandemic as a portal. And it is, you know, this, uh, you know, combined with the a subsequent catalytic event of George Floyd's murder and the mobilization and the uprisings that have resulted, you know, we have a, a moment now that um, people are seeing with new eyes the structures of oppression and injustice that have been there all along, but whether they're more directly impacted because of the economic system or the layoffs of the pandemic or the healthcare system or whatever, um, uh, people have been sensitized and they're, they're, they're opening their eyes. And a lot of people in corporate America are doing that. Um, I, I think what we're seeing though is that um, uh, you know, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the call to defund the police, particularly using that divest from policing, invest in services and resources um, for the community, that framework, it is highlighting how um, our broken kind of crony capitalistic system has been, our extractive economy has been fueling a lot of the, the crack, the, 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 the decrease in civil liberties. Um, that people are ex experiencing and the kind of the inequality in our society, which is the lived experience of so many every day. And so there's a, an innate barrier now that perhaps people are seeing with new eyes and people are struggling to grapple with how to get involved. And, you know, some of the most successful partnerships, I think, are where corporate America or corporations are trusting the leadership of those who've been working on this in their own communities, who have visions to reimagine what community well-being and safety looks like for their communities in face of 
you know, generations of structural oppression uh, and really trusting those voices and, you know, redistributing their resources, whether that's in kind to help them set up organizations and websites or service or programs, but also just monetary resources to really back them and their vision for what the, you know, should be happening in their community and their organizing and base building. Um, and, and, and that's been encouraging. There has been a lot of that. And then, but to be honest, I think we're, you know, because we're seeing um, the intersections, you know, because we're bringing this economic analysis to a uh, civil rights, um, re like rebringing, bringing it back, you know, it was, it was absolutely there during the sixties and the end of um, Dr. King's life, of course, but I think that we kind of got away of that in the eighties and the nineties in particular, and we're bringing that economic analysis back and how it's intersecting with people's lived identities, whether it's, you know, racially, gender identity, sexual orientation, et cetera. Um, and because of that, I think that there's, gonna, there's, there's a little bit of stop and start and a little bit of hesitation from corporate America because of their participation in that and their, their reinforcing of that um, economic system that has been, um, you know, bolstering these systems of oppression for, for so long. Um, but, you know, I think that we have to be hopeful. Um, you know, the, the conversation is shifting in ways none of us imagined three months ago, right? And, um, and I think that the more um, we get down this line and the more people are listening to the most impacted um, people and leaders and communities, um, that facilitation, those partnerships will come much more easily. And there is hope. The, the respondents to the, the last poll said so fully 75% feel that our, our uh, children, the younger uh, generations, the coming leaders of America are going to be more engaged in the fight for justice. I want to make just one final point uh, before we, we depart. Uh, this program, this whole uh, effort is not partisan. Um, this is really going back to American first principles. It's not about party. Anybody from any party who is an American can, uh, can stand behind the fight for liberty. We might have different views of, of how that unfolds. We might have different positions, but it starts with listening. You said this, Wade. Carol, you said that. Jorge, you said that. The whole idea is we have to listen. We have to seriously try to understand the, the positions, the ideas, um, the, the activities of others and try to be just considerate, right? Try to, try to uh, form a more perfect union through our social compact. I'd like to thank you all for, for your work, for your struggles, uh, for, the, for the wonderful contributions of your staff, boards, uh, communities. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's thank the nonprofit you, thank board. You, thank you, Carolyn Jorge. For, for, uh, for coming and uh, come and visit with us uh, next Tuesday for our next episode. Have a great day and stay safe, everyone.